Please be seated. From everlasting to everlasting, God is present. We come to confession to name our smallness, remembering our humility as a gift, and handing over our imperfection to the divine. Let us confess together. We hunger and thirst to make a name for ourselves, to achieve perfection as if that was possible, to say and do the right thing, and still in our striving to live flawlessly, we are complicit in injustice, we make big mistakes, and we struggle against our own limitations. Point us toward the saints who from their labors rest Remind us to live faithfully, not seeking veneration, but wholeness. Let us rest in you. Amen. God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Friends, receive the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Rest in this knowledge. God is here among us now. Let us remember this together. The peace of Christ be with you. seated. First, a little history lesson. Uh, Since the ninth century, the Church of Jesus Christ has celebrated All Saints Day on or around November 1st of every year. It began as a way to note the anniversaries of the deaths of Christian martyrs. The problem, though, was that within just a few hundred years, there were so many martyrs that it became hard to give them each their own day. And so we set aside one day to honor all the saints, those we know by name, the saints we don't remember, and the saints we never knew. Now, in the Reformed tradition, in Presbyterian churches, everybody is a saint, especially those who lives, lived ordinary lives. The saints uh, that sang with us in worship, 
and prayed for us through hard times and taught our children about Jesus and invited us to lunch after church all the while, quietly moving through our midst before dying on this side of eternity and passing to the other. And so it is right that we honor and remember them by reading their names and tolling a bell today during the communion prayer. But first, a word about the meditations you'll hear next from Megan and Charlene and from me. As your pastors, the three of us are called to travel with saints and their loved ones through death. It is a holy privilege. We're there, close enough to feel the weight of silence when there is nothing to say, close enough to be startled by the hilariously dark humor of grieving families, close enough to witness glimpses of hope that renew our own confidence in the resurrection. So today we're going to share a few of those glimpses as a response to the question posed in our scripture reading right at verse 13. The question goes like this, who are these robed in white and where have they come from? Today we hope to tell you. Listen now for God's word as it comes to you and for you. After this I looked, and there was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, robed in white with palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. And all the angels stood around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell on their faces before the throne and worshiped God. They were singing, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these? robed in white, and where have they come from? And I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Holy wisdom, holy word. Millennia ago, in a cave on the island of Patmos in the Aegean Sea, I imagine the Apostle Paul laid his head on a rock pillow and drifted off to sleep. When he awoke, he began to write down the intricacies of his dream. The ones standing before him, the ones who came out of the great ordeal, the ones who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. As we read John's words in the year 2023, who are these that John saw? What was the criteria for them being there? How does one wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb? Well, I have some stories. When I first started at the church, Blake, a member of the church, 
would frequently stop by my office during the week just to say hi. The effort that Blake put in to offer welcome to me was profound, and his welcome extended to all that he encountered. Whenever attending church, Blake emanated his spiritual gift of hospitality. His smile would light up a room. When Blake died rather unexpectedly, the hospitality partners of the church showed up for his memorial service in a profound way. They continued his legacy of welcome. On Sunday mornings, I still experience Blake's presence, and I experience it through the incredible welcome of others in this sacred space. With each smile that I encounter, I am filled with hope that my friend is now in the arms of our God. Blake now dons his white robe, and his legacy invites others to share the love of Christ with others. Last year, I got word that a church member had been taken to the hospital. I stood alongside the family holding the heavy news that she would not recover. We gathered around her bedside, and the family began sharing memories. Memories that evoked laughter and smiles, and memories where the only response was that squeeze of the hand and silence. The love that filled that hospital room was palpable, and it all pointed back to the person that was in the bed. To Susan. Susan had lived her life as an example of incredible welcome. She invited others into her sacred circle by calling them family. In the tenderness of death, God's hand was present in it all. Susan's family was able to gather together with her and emotionally prepare for her goodbye. The family ushered their precious Susan into a new set of clothes, a wardrobe consisting of white with embellishments of welcome and lace of love. When I visited with a congregant at a rehabilitation facility not too long ago, I was having one heck of a day. Anything that could go wrong was going wrong, from trying to find the door to the rehabilitation center, to pulling into the right parking lot. When I finally made it to her room, things changed. I asked her how she was doing, and she shared with me how a disgruntled one staff person had been towards her. When the staff person came in their room and were short and snippy, and they didn't pay attention to their requests. This individual then shared with me that she decided to do something about it. She told me that when the staff person came back into her room after the first encounter, she kindly asked them to stop and to look into her eyes. And she told the individual, I know that the job you do is hard. And I know that you are not paid enough to do all it is that you do. But I want you to know that I see you and I appreciate you. Can I give you a hug? Immediately, the staff person's demeanor changed because they had been seen. Sylvia chose to walk alongside another. And in sharing her story with me, she chose to live her life as a life of love and faithfulness. And in doing so, brought a bit of heaven to earth. The criteria for standing before the Holy One in robes dressed in white is to faithfully love one another. If you're looking for hope, you can find glimpses. Glimpses through holy welcomes. Glimpses in ushering a loved one into the arms of our Savior. Glimpses 
and making space to see one another. I want to tell you about two phone calls that I received this year. These calls uh, served as my introduction to two people I would never meet in person, but would get to know nonetheless. I want you to know who they are also, because to know them is to understand how seriously this church is about our welcome. To know them and their stories is to know ourselves. The first phone call came on a Saturday night late last year. I was at home, posted up on the couch watching football when I noticed a new voicemail from Bill McKenzie, a member of this church. Bill and I are close, but we are not talking on the phone Saturday night close. And I didn't know exactly what he needed, but before I called him back, I went outside to get some privacy on the back porch. My instincts told me this wasn't a conversation to be had with one eye on the game. Saturday night phone calls from church members almost always come with news that life is fragile and death is near. When Bill answered my return call, I sighed, I let out a sigh of relief. Bill was fine, he said. His family was okay, he said. They were on vacation at the beach, and he said all of this really quickly so that he could get to his reason for calling on a Saturday night. He was calling on behalf of his friend and former colleague, Lindsay Lloyd. Lindsay was in the hospital. Death was near. I didn't know Lindsay, never heard his name before Bill spoke it on the phone in the same long sentence as the words dying, alone, afraid, doesn't have a church, wants to talk to a pastor. Bill asked me to call him that night and talk to him. Lindsay and I talked later that evening. When Lindsay answered my call, I immediately identified myself as Bill McKenzie's pastor. It was too early for us to bond in our relationship over the other thing we had in common, which is that we both knew life was fragile. Too early, so we started with our shared friendship with Bill. Bill brought us together, two strangers meeting on the phone, staring into the darkness of dying, bonded by the audacious faithfulness of Bill McKenzie, who believed that his church would follow through on its commitment to welcome everyone. Lindsay didn't know me and never would, but he did trust the witness of Bill's life, and so we talked, and he talked about his faith, his journey, his mistakes, his regrets, his dreams that had gone unfulfilled, his prayers that had never been answered, his hope, his uncertainty about what came next. He talked, and I read Scripture to him, and we prayed together. Neither one of us made any promises to reconnect. We both understood this would be it. A couple days later, word came that Lindsay died. But the story did not end there. 
His sister called me from California to ask if the church would host Lindsay's memorial service and if one of our pastors would lead it and if we could provide the music and also do the bulletins and also host a lunch for Lindsay's family and friends, many of whom would be coming from out of town. We said yes to all of it. And through us and through you all, Lindsay and his family glimpsed hope and held on to it because of the way God had worked through this community of faith. The other phone call I want to tell you about came one weekday afternoon a couple months ago while I was sitting at my desk up in my office. Just It was Harvey Hoffman, another member of this church and someone that I'll always remember for hosting the very first pastoral care visit that I made in Dallas to a member's home. He wanted to know that day he called if I'd be willing to lead his sister's memorial service. I was like, slow down, Harvey. Your sister just died? (laughs) He said, yeah, a couple days ago, his sister Betty Eubanks had died a few days earlier at her home in Whitesboro, Texas. I don't know her, but she knew us. Harvey told me that the Sunday before she passed, she was at home with her daughters, worshiping with us on live stream, just as she'd done every Sunday before for the last few years. And Harvey said the service would be in Whitesboro. And while He was telling me about the service. I, of course, was Googling Whitesboro. I'm like, I don't know about Whitesboro. I checked it out. It was good. I said, of course, I'll be there. Lindsay was on my mind at the time. I would glimpsed hope in our welcome of Lindsay's family, and I wanted to glimpse it again, even if I had to go to Whitesboro, even if Betty wouldn't be on the list of names that we would read on All Saints Sunday, even though Betty wasn't a member. When I got to the funeral home the day of Betty's memorial, Harvey and his partner Robert greeted me and We embraced, and then uh, I hugged Betty's three daughters. The service was going to start in 30 minutes, and they were still making last-minute arrangements, trying to figure out what order everybody was going to speak in and and if the music was queued up and and if the mics were working. I was uncomfortable with all the last-minute movement. I didn't know what to do other than sit down and let... Whitesboro be Whitesboro. I wasn't in charge that day. And after a few minutes sitting by myself there, I thank God for it. But I want to tell you what I said at the start of Betty's service. Word for word, these are the notes I retrieved from my files for today. I told them Betty belonged to the First Presbyterian Church of Dallas where I'm the pastor. I never met Betty, never knew she attended worship every Sunday on live stream since the pandemic began, never knew she considered me her pastor, and never knew I'd be here today in Whitesboro bearing witness to the resurrection of Jesus Christ in her name. And so I praise God for completing in death what the circumstances of life would never allow. Betty couldn't be with her church in Dallas in person ever. But today the church in Dallas has come to Whitesboro to be with her and her family. And so on behalf of the church, please receive our prayers. We are grateful to be counted in the company of Betty's beloved community. Amen.
Every person, every body is intimately woven into creation. From our birth, tiny lungs, secret chambers of God's newest breath, cries out, bursting divine life into our common air. In return, creation breathes into tiny souls, love and gaze, and soon whispers worry and heartache strewn along the common strife of the living. We breathe out and we breathe in from our world, from each other, like thread moving over and under, over and under, brushing up against the goodness of another and imprinting hues of our kindness from the goodness imparted in us. And along the way, we also despise and we weep. We are injured and scared we'll be hurt again. We forgive and sometimes we don't. In the measure of time, each of us are uniquely given on this earthly life. We move across our days and over our years, weaving and being woven into the common cloth of life. And death can feel like an unraveling from that cloth. And we would mostly rather turn away while death does its swift pulling. Being too close, we fear, will leave us bruised for a lifetime, unable to hem our lives back in. But whether we look away from death or bravely look squarely at it, or have profound love to remain close when death comes, we all incur death's indiscriminate injury and our fresh and old bruises from grief remind us of the unraveling that have left us breathlessly hurt. A part of my vocation as a minister is to stay, to remain when death does its unraveling and grief leaves its mess. My job and my privilege is to stay, to remain, if only to be a body taking up space in the midst of the disquiet, to be a still entity in the chaos of pain. And it's not because we are experts in the matters of life and death. But pastors are the ones who are called to make an attempt at making meaning when meaning is scarce. This responsibility to utter resurrection hope, this responsibility for me, though, has been a saving grace because every time I dutifully proclaim the love of God from which none of us can be separated, not life, nor death, nor anything in all creation. I keep on believing again and again in God who is close to the brokenhearted, in God who saves those who are crushed in spirit. For this is my profession of faith, the promise in God's word that I steward and offer to others so that they may know what it feels like to sit beneath the compassion of God. And perhaps over time, 
or in a holy glimpse of eternal life, love, we might be healed in the name of Jesus the Christ. A few weeks ago, I felt like a strong column taking up a steady space in front of a small group who also stood upright, looking like columns. Our bodies and our common hearts established together a fortress, a boundary of standing columns made of consoling love to surround our friend Regina Hunt and her family as they place Reverend Hank Hunt's ashes in the final resting place here in our garden columbarium just outside our chapel. We all took part in this at once sacred and strange enactment, something so different and odd and removed from anything that we do in our normal days. Scriptures were read, prayers were said, a poem, a love letter was spoken. Hank's Thursday morning study group watched with every care as Regina and Hank's teenage son, Logan, awkwardly carried with their forehands a small container, a cylinder, holding Hank's ashes and letters of love. The two walked over a short path of cobbly stones and lifted up that time capsule-looking container as they reached up and carefully tucked in the cylinder into the rightful place. In that moment, I had two clear thoughts in my mind. One, how glad I am for the others who are standing with me, bearing witness together to what each of us must do at some point in some version of this awkward and hard thing. And two, how glad I am that Logan is a tall young man. Because there's no way Regina would have been able to reach the space reserved for Hank on her own. A detail I had not considered in all the planning we had done. <laughs> there is really no way to do this elegantly. It is a hard thing. A strange thing. But in the midst of us doing it together, hearing together again God who is near, declaring together God who is there when we ascend to the heaven, God who is there when we make our bed in the depths, God whose hand will meet us when we settle in the farthest limits of the sea, somewhere in the mix of this earthy dying, there in the chapel garden, a glimpse of hope, warm light touching our backs as a balm over rigid bones of grief. A glimpse of hope, a trustworthy friend, friend standing as another column, protecting the sacred ritual upon whose steadiness Regina leaned with grief's heavy weight the unraveling you believe in moments like this won't go on and on. That you might believe that it may indeed slow down this unraveling before you fear that everything, you, will fall apart. Sometimes the thread of our lives that are woven together up and down offers glitters with special gifts that make us pause by a wondrous light. Such a gift appeared on my desk at the end of the first week of my call here to FPC. It was the last week of July. Monday through Thursday was filled with meetings and meetings and meetings, and I saw on my calendar for Friday afternoon a pastoral visit to a church member in hospice care. Yes, I thought, I get to do my pastor thing this afternoon. I was ready for my afternoon mission when I saw a big bouquet of flowers had arrived on my desk. On the envelope of the card poking out from the beautiful arrangement, 
read a name, Carolyn Walton. I checked my calendar, at which point the calendar was not my own. It was given to me, scheduled ahead, even before my arrival. And I checked the name, and I realized it's the same name, Carolyn Walton, the one I was to visit. I picked up the heavy vase and the beautiful bouquet, trying to visualize how I would secure this arrangement in the car ride to Carolyn's home. Someone must have known I was going there and left this bouquet here for me to deliver it. I decided to turn the back of this envelope to get a clue about the sender of this bouquet. The clue read, Welcome to FPC, Charlene. Love, Carolyn. Who was doing her pastor thing now? I thought. The one who is dying. The one who is loving. The one who has a seasoned heart for embracing everyone as if they were always meant to be here. Entering Carolyn's home that afternoon, I immediately sensed the hospitality of honesty and affection that infused the air. I sat at her bedside, becoming fast friends that afternoon, and a few more afternoons after that until her last day. Each time I went, I sat on an avocado green folding chair, the same chair that some of you who have visited Carolyn likely sat on. The pair of those green chairs are in my office today, ready to receive guests. And I will practice the hospitality of honesty and affection that I witnessed of a beloved who was dying and loving in one breath. So who are these, robed in white, and where have they come from? They come from the common cloth of the multitude from every time and place who for moments or weeks or years or a lifetime have been our companions, pew sharers, gentle teachers, all on our way to our common home. They have arrived first, complete in their baptism, they are singing amen and amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and ever. And one day we shall gather again with the loves in our hearts. Until then, let us love. Let us love. Let us love. Let the people of hope say, Amen.
Scripture says this is the fast we choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to share our bread with the hungry, to clothe the naked, to bring the homeless poor into our house, and to comfort the afflicted. Then, and only then, will our light shine forth and break like the dawn, and our healing spring up quickly. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust him to share the feast which he has prepared. Won't you meet us here? The Lord be with you. Let us lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of us all, at this table we are reminded of the love you pour out upon us, and it is with glad hearts and with profound expectation that we come before you hungry for the bread of life and the cup of salvation. At this table, the eyes of the apostles were opened. At this table, you call us together with those who have come before in every time and place. We rejoice that at this table we gather with all the saints to sing your praise. In celebration and thanksgiving to you, O God, we name before you those that have died this year. Thank you for the gift of their lives. Stephen Wilmoth. Nancyanna Knott. Blake Ogden. Margaret Teat. Anne Shelton. Susan Flagg. Charlotte Allison. Betty Jo Traeger. Ron Moore. Charlie Fry. Martha Martin. Dorothy Wood. Maxie Tire. Betty Blackburn. Clara Peterson. Jim Highland. Wilson Smith. Carolyn Walton. Annie Franklin. Hank Hunt. (laughs) 
On this day, O oh God, where we remember with gratitude and with sorrow of our loss for those that are gone, we give you thanks for the cloud of witnesses who encourage us and inspire us in faith. We give you thanks for the precious memories of loved ones in our hearts, for the joy and abiding love that remain. We give you thanks for Jesus who once and for all conquered death and who promises that one day we will be reunited with all the saints. So God of the living in this ordinary meal, show forth your power, your grace that brings new life even in death, your power that unites us with those who have entered the church triumphant, your power that gives us hope in the resurrection, trusting in your power. We pray the prayer that you taught us to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is a kingdom the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night that Jesus would be betrayed and turned over to those who conspired against him, Jesus gathered his closest friends, the disciples, that he called to follow him. He prepared a table before them, and he took the bread, and after blessing it, he broke it. saying, this is my body given for you. Whenever you eat of it, do so remembering me. In the same way, he poured the cup, saying, this is the new covenant sealed in my blood for your forgiveness of sins and for the forgiveness of many. Whenever you drink of this cup, do so remembering me. And so friends, whenever we share of this bread and drink of this cup, we do proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes. All has been made ready. Won't you come and share and join in the feast of the Lord's table?
hearts with me in prayer. God, you have fed us graciously and generously from this table, from your love. May we go forth and love others graciously and generously also. We give you thanks for the gifts of this table. May it nourish us and encourage us, comfort us, and send us forth. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. on communion Sundays, we have teams of home communion servers that go out into the community, to our community, to share communion with those that belong here at First Presbyterian Church of Dallas, but aren't able to come on Sundays. Following worship in the parlor, if you are interested, come and be with us for a lunch and learn about home communion. We want to be able to provide home communion to all of those that are interested, and we don't quite have enough teams at this point. Siblings in Christ, go out into the world to love and share faithfulness remembering all of the saints who have come before. May God bless you and keep you. May God be kind and gracious to you. May God look upon you with favor and give you peace this day and every day. Amen. Amen. 